Welcome to U.S. Air Conditioning Training, the basics of truck, bus, and heavy equipment air conditioning diagnostics. My name is Jim Guzzo, and I've been in the air conditioning business for over 30 years. I started U.S. Air Conditioning in Denver, Colorado in 1991. Some of you are probably at different levels of AC experience, but doesn't matter what level you are at, these things today, these principles will help you understand the AC system better. And also, these simple practices will help save you and your customer money. Our mission today is to help you understand exactly how the AC system works, to know exactly what is wrong with the system and not have to guess at it, to not oversell but to do what's required, to not have to go back the next week and do the job over. We want to provide cost-effective practices to make your customers happy. Have no comebacks. How does the AC system work? Flow of the system and how the components work together. Diagnose exactly what is wrong with the system. We're going to go over gauge readings and what they mean. Some service and repair, refrigerant oil, compressors, dryers, free on recovery, and some routine maintenance. To give you an idea of how much work we do, what kind of equipment we maintain. I brought a few photos of some of our job sites. In this particular photo here is a photo of uh, one customer's Caterpillar equipment. This is their lineup out on the job site. This particular customer here, I maintained every piece of air conditioning that they had every other week for over 10 years every other week, all year long. Here's another lineup with a few older scrapers. These are cat scrapers. These are 631s and 637Ds, a um, little older ones. But we maintained these air conditioners and every piece of equipment they had every month. Here's a photo of uh, a Humvee at Fort Carson, Colorado. And back in 04 and 05, when the military was armoring all these vehicles, they put air conditioners in them at the same time. This particular service body here, um, they needed a little bit of expert help on making the unit work, making a unit work for this particular application. And I went down there uh, for a few days and, and helped them line this one out. You can see here the condenser on the roof and the evaporator in the back wall here. Now what's what's tricky about this is the the frame, the chassis, the roll cage and everything is all made out of aluminum. This is a small fleet of buses that we maintain. We have serviced hundreds and hundreds of buses, large and small. And these buses here have split systems. They've got the condenser in the outside skirt here, and the evaporators are up generally in the back, in the ceiling, along with the factory cab air conditioner. Now, some of the larger buses, they got self-contained units that are either mounted in the rear of the bus, such as a Gillick or um, the older Neal plans, and then a lot of them got rooftop self-contained units. This particular machine here is a Wirtgen mill, and what this machine does is it, it mills the floor of the gypsum mine the gypsum that's used in drywall. This machine here came with factory air conditioning from Germany, but they didn't have very good luck with the air conditioners and they asked me what I could do. So I, I took the, the two systems that they had in this machine out 
and reinstalled two large units. You can see the condensers up here on the roof and the evaporators, two brand new large evaporators in the ceiling. We done three or four of these back in 04 and 05 and we still maintain these today. Here's a, an old Komatsu dozer in 1987. And this particular machine here was added to a fleet a few years ago. And of course it was so old that you can't buy any of the factory equipment for it, the evaporators and condensers and such. So we ended up having to make everything for it. And the compressor mounts we had to make, they're up here at the front of the motor. And, uh, you can see the condenser. We made the mounts to hang it off the back of the cab. And then there's an evaporator here right in the front, right in, just below the windshield. Uh, when we was done with this, this machine cooled very well. This is one of a fleet of trucks we maintained in Florida for a few years. They also had Kenworth Fords and many pieces of heavy equipment, John Deere's and Caterpillar's. Who can do AC service work? Anyone who's got a desire and knows how to think about their work and think about how things work. Don't want to get bogged down too much with manuals and gauge readings and trying to figure all these things out. If you follow these few principles that I'm going to lay out for you here pretty quick, you're going to be able to do this. We don't want any parts changers. We don't want to take and throw $2,000 worth of parts at a truck or a machine and hope we fixed it. Now here's a basic diagram of an air conditioning system. We got to, one has to understand how the air conditioning system works. This, this is what will help you diagnose out in the field or in your shop or anywhere else. You've got to understand how the air conditioning system works and what its function is. The, the primary function of the air conditioner is to remove heat and humidity from the cab. Heat always travels too cold. Heat travels too cold. If you've got a glass of ice water the water in the glass travels to the ice cube. The ice cube removes the heat in the water. That's how it works. So our function here today is, is to create a cold evaporator, recirculate the air in the cab with the blowers, and remove the heat out. Now here's, a, here's the compressor here. Now the compressor only pumps gas. It does not pump liquid. When the Freon leaves the compressor, it leaves as a high pressure gas. You can see it here in the red. High pressure gas. It enters into the top of the condenser as a high pressure gas and it goes through. As it's going through, by way of the engine fan, or an electric fan, it causes it in the condenser to change state. And when it exits the condenser, it comes out as a liquid, a high pressure liquid. So the function of the condenser is to change the state of the Freon from gas to a liquid. The liquid leaves the condenser in a high pressure and enters into the dryer, where Freon is stored and Freon is filtered here in the dryer. Exits out of the dryer to the expansion valve. Now here's the magic of Freon, the chemistry of the Freon. The expansion valve is shuts down to where it just opens to create a very tiny orifice, maybe seven thousandths or ten thousandths of a pass to let the Freon through. Well, under high pressure, 
high pressure liquid, when it hits that orifice, it changes state again and it comes out the other side of the expansion valve right here as a low pressure gas. It comes out as a mist, low pressure cold mist. It, 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 it leaves the expansion valve and goes on to the evaporator. Now it's still in the, in the low pressure cold gas, very cold. It's 32 degrees or, or below. It enters into the evaporator and makes the evaporator cold. Now, like I said before, the blowers will recirculate the air in the cab, recirculates it across the evaporator to remove the heat and send it back out into the cab as a cooler air. And then leaves the evaporator and then back to the compressor. Now maybe we can just go over that quickly again. It leaves the compressor is a high pressure gas, gas only. It enters into the top of the condenser and by way of the engine fan cooling it, exits out at the bottom of the condenser as a liquid. It changes state here. The air conditioner Freon changes state twice. It leaves the condenser as a high pressure liquid. Into the dryer, out of the dryer is a high pressure liquid. Goes to the expansion valve and changes state again to a low pressure mist, low pressure cold gas. And enters into the evaporator and the evaporator is cold. The blowers in the cab recirculate the warm air in the cab across the evaporator and cools it down and sends it back out as cooler air into the cab. Now on the basic AC system, you'll have a, a, a low pressure switch and a thermostat. Now the thermostat will cycle the compressor out when it gets down to a certain temperature, whatever that's set at. Could be 32 degrees but you'll feel colder in the cab. It'll bring it down from 120 in the sun and bring it down to where you got a comfortable 70 degrees inside. And then it will cycle out. The low pressure switch is there in case the system gets low on Freon, it'll cycle the compressor out. Because if you don't cycle it out and it's lost Freon or it's low on Freon, it can destroy the compressor. The compressor is running without oil and Freon. Over here on the high pressure side could either be over here before the condenser or in the line after the condenser you will have a fan switch which will uh, regulate the fan. When it kicks in and kicks out most of the time the engine fan will kick in somewhere around 275 pounds of high pressure, head pressure, and it will bring it down to roughly 150 pounds and then kick out. And as soon as the head pressure starts building again, it'll start it all over again. Kick in about 275, bring it down to about 150 pounds over here, and then cycle it out. Also, there will be a high pressure switch on either side, one side or the other. The high pressure switch will keep it in case something fails it won't go over 400 pounds or so. It'll just cycle the compressor out because high head pressure is dangerous to the, to the compressor. It just overheats it. Now the way the chemistry of the Freon works, the higher the temperature the higher the pressure. The lower the temperature, the lower the pressure. So you see over here you can have roughly a 26 pound suction pressure and you got 32 degrees at the evaporator. Over here 
a normal operating uh, a normal operating even head pressure is about 180 pounds. So you can see, and this is hot. This is hot. This is cold. We'll go through some diagnostics here. If a machine is reported as not cooling, check all of the obvious first. Check the compressor belts. Is it missing? Is it adjusted correctly? Because if the compressor is not moving, and if the, if the belt is slipping, you don't always hear it, but it is slipping, and the compressor is just stopping and starting and stopping and starting. And it'll give you the air conditioner won't cool, and um, you'll get false readings with it on your gauge set. Check to see if all components are mounted and in proper place. Dryer, the compressors, the line sets, the condenser. I've seen condensers broken and fallen, fallen off the mounts on equipment. I've seen compressors with mounts broken or the compressor was not put back on and was just laying in the belly pan of a dozer or a scraper. I mean, that, all these things are, are possible. So it's very important always to check the obvious things first. If all appear to be normal, if everything is okay, everything's mounted, before running the machine, just turn on the ignition switch. Just turn it on. Turn on the AC switch and listen for the compressor clutch to kick in and engage. All we want to do here is to see if there's enough pressure in the system to operate the switches, the pressure switches. Because if the pressure switches don't work, the air conditioner is not going to work. If the compressor does not engage, install your gauge set to see if there is Freon in it. Here all we're checking for is pressure in the system. Like I said, the gauge readings mean nothing at this point. All we are looking for is enough pressure to kick in the pressure switches. If the switches don't kick in, or if the system is empty, then pressure up the system with Freon and leak test it. If the system has pressure and the system pressure switches don't kick in, then trace out an electrical problem. It could be a bad thermostat. It could be a bad pressure switch. It could be a broken clutch wire. I've, I've been through all of them. You could have a micro switch in the dash that's broken or bad, and it won't send power out to the AC circuit. If the system has pressure and kicks in the pressure switches, then run the machine. Go ahead and start, to start it up. Run the system at slightly above idle, maybe 12 to 1500 RPM is good. After a minute or two of running, feel the metal on the suction line to see if it's getting cold. You can feel it right up at the evaporator, up by the firewall. You can put your hand on that. Is it getting cold? Um, you know, it, do you see it coming down on your uh, suction gauge, your low pressure gauge? This is the quickest and easiest way to tell if the system's cooling. If the system has a sight glass on the dryer or a moisture indicator or an inline sight glass, check to see if it's clear. The sight glass will appear clear if it is full. If it's not full and if it's half full, if it's fizzing, it is low and needs to be leak tested. Check the hot water valves. If the machine has manual valves, shut them down. Passing hot water into the heater core will mix hot water with the cold evaporator and cause the system to not cool. If it does not have manual valves, 
check the factory control valve to see if it shuts down when the temperature control is in the cold AC mode. Now some of these hot water valves, some of the cable operated ones, some of the electric operated ones, those hot water valves don't last long, even brand new. Even brand new I found them uh, leaking brand new. And the way to check them when you, when you buy them, let's just say I go over to one of the truck shops and I buy 10 or 12 hot water valves to put on the service truck. When you open one of those up, put it in the off position to see if you can blow through it. If you can blow through it, it's going to pass hot water. And when it gets 90 to 95 to 100 degrees out, that little bit of dribble past that through that hot water valve will cause that air conditioner to not cool in the cab. It's very important to have that hot water shut off, especially the hotter it gets outside. If, if, when you get into the season of air conditioning, oh, say, depending on where you live, uh, April to till September or October, just totally manually shut the hot water off going to the cab. That's the, that's the safest way to do it. Then you, you, you can be assured that the hot water is not messing with the air conditioning. And automobiles work the same way. Cars work the same way. They all, they either got a door on the in the ductwork that shuts the hot water off or shuts the heater core off totally, or they got hot water valves in them. Check the engine fan. Make sure the engine fan or electric condenser fans are working properly. If the fans don't work, it will create high head pressure and the system won't cool. Check the cab blowers to make sure they are operational in all speeds. Check the cab filters to make sure they are clean. The recirculate filter and the outside air filters both. Now heavy equipment all have filters. They all have inside air filters and they got outside air filters. They have both. And it is imperative that those are clean. After any repair or service is performed, we will want to check all operations again. While running the machine, check for the compressor to cycle in and out on the low temperature. If the machine has an enclosed covered clutch, now a lot of you guys have seen that where they got a, a plate that covers the clutch in the front and there's screws that hold that together there. If the machine has an enclosed covered clutch, watch the gauges for the cycle. Hold the RPMs up on the machine or the truck or the automobile and watch it the temperature and the pressure go down and when it gets so cold it should disengage that compressor clutch. Okay, If it's got an enclosed clutch you can't see that unless you put the gauge on it to see if it cycles out and cycles in. Check the engine fan operation or condenser fans. Now the, with the engine fans if you got an electric fan or if you got an air fan on a truck or a piece of heavy equipment or even a little car, they got electric fans on them. Most of the time you'll see that the engine fan, we covered this a little while back, the engine fan will kick in about 275 pounds on the head side, cool it down, bring it down, and, and it'll kick out again, say roughly down 150 pounds. gauges and what they mean. 
not as much as you think. Don't get flustered with this or overwhelmed. The biggest problem with guys that, that are good mechanics and they work in shops and uh, full time in, in a garage, a lot of them say, I don't like air conditioning. I don't do this and I don't do that. But I don't mess with air conditioning. And I can understand their point. But a lot of it is because they don't really understand how the air conditioner system works. This is easy. This is really easy stuff. So don't get flustered with it. Don't get overwhelmed by it. High head pressure gauge tells the pressure on the head side. Remember back in our diagram we talked about the high pressure gas and the high pressure liquid. It's 90% not to worry about. Mostly it's from no air moving across the condenser that will give you high head pressure. And we'll get to that. The suction pressure gauge tells the evaporator temperature and pressure. That's the most important gauge. 26 pounds of pressure equal 32 degrees on the suction gauge. That's about right, right there. And I'll, we'll get to that as well. Gauge pressures increase and decrease with temperature. Remember we talked about that a little bit. The hotter it is outside, the higher the pressure. The colder it is outside, the lower the pressure is. Same in the system. Now here on your left is your suction gauge. This is the low pressure blue suction gauge. The suction pressure is the pressure that goes, remember where we talked about changing state at the expansion valve? It's between the expansion valve, the evaporator, to the compressor. That's the low pressure suction side. And this is the high pressure gauge right here. The discharge side, that's discharge from the condenser and runs, or discharge from the compressor through the condenser, the dryer, and to the expansion valve. Now here's a little bit of a diagram to explain so, you, so I can illustrate. A lot of people don't know what these numbers in here mean inside these gauges. But you can see the blue, the blue ring is for 134A, which is common for all automotive style air conditioners today. R12, if there's any of those out there, are still pretty close to the same, but uh, they're a little different. Right here, 26 to 27 pounds of pressure straight across is about 32 degrees. 26 pounds equal 32 degrees. Guys, this is this, this gauge here is your evaporator temperature. This is how cold it is in the evaporator. That's why it's important that in a normal operating time, this is about where your gauge will be at 1,000 RPMs or so, right here. That's normal. If it's a if it's a hundred degree day, it may be running up here. All right, but that's just because it's so hot in the cab. The evaporator is so hot, and the heat in the cab will be up here, and it'll take a while to run it. But once it gets down, this is the normal operating range. This ring is your evaporator temperature. Thirty two degrees. Twenty six, twenty seven pounds. Now, here's some hypotheticals here. If a system has a high suction pressure, like I said on, in the last frame, say 40 to 60 pounds, generally this means there's something warming up the evaporator. It may be the hot water valves 
passing hot water. That's why it's important to shut those down or make sure they're not passing. Or if it's 90 to 100 degrees outside, the AC system needs to run for a while to be able to bring that cab temperature down. It may run. I, I've seen them. I've been out in scrapers and you got all the glass all the way around the operator in the cab. It just and it's just absorbing all the sun. And it's it's a hundred degrees outside and it's hot. It's just baking inside. Well when you first get that air conditioner running or repaired and then running or whatever, it's gonna take quite a while to remove the heat in that cab. But just remember, evaporator temperature is your low side gauge. 26 pounds equal 32 degrees. Most pieces of heavy equipment will run a normal 20 to 30 pounds pressure at 1200 RPM. This is normal. When a gauge is running below 20 pounds, normally your thermostat is bad and or the evaporator is packed with dirt. The compressor clutch should cycle out before, before this or short cycle if the evaporator only is packed. Now, you see here, all right, you remember we talked about what the evaporator and the, and the blowers do. The blowers recirculate the air in the cab send it across the evaporator and removes the heat out of the cab. Well, what do you do when you got an evaporator that looks like this? You cannot move air across that evaporator. So what's going to happen? The cab is going to stay warm because there's no air get, the heat is not getting uh, recirculated. On the other side of this blanket of dirt right here, on the other side is the evaporator and what's it doing? It's just running cold because there's no recirculation from the warm cab to warm up the evaporator. So it's just going to keep getting rapidly cold, 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 colder and it's going to kick out on the, on the thermostat and it's going to cycle there in and out, in and out, in and out. But And you know it's cold everywhere you feel on the, on the evaporator it's cold but the cab isn't cooled down and that's the reason why right there this needs to be pressure washed all my service trucks for field service have pressure washers on them and it's for this reason right here every job that we do every piece of equipment that we service we pressure wash the evaporators every time and clean the felders If the suction gauge has a reading of zero or below, means the expansion valve is shut down. The expansion valve is the only thing in that system that will shut down. If, and it'll need replacing. Okay, once in a while you, you'll get a dryer on an older machine that will explode internally and send the beads through the system or, or through the line and that and that will pack up and block up in the line. But other than that, the only thing that will that, that brings it down to zero or into a vacuum is, is an expansion valve shut down. If both gauge readings have an equal amount of pressure, just say hypothetically a hundred on the suction side and a hundred on your head pressure side. While the system is, is full of Freon and engaged means the compressor is bad. It has lost its joules and will not move Freon. See, we're going to get into this in the next frame, but it's not pumping Freon if it's a zero, if it's a hundred on the suction side and it's a hundred on the head side and it's engaged and running, it means the compressor is not pumping Freon. 
to check a compressor that seems to have lost its reed valves, crimp the suction line with the vice grip, the line going to the compressor, crimp the rubber hose, and run for about one minute. If the compressor is good, it will pull it into a vacuum. If it doesn't pull down, then the compressor is bad. And then that will uh, that will tell you exactly what is going on there. And that and that's the point of these principles here to in, in how to do this is how to quickly check these things. Head pressure. A normal operating head pressure is from 125 to 225 pounds. Say if you got a remote mount condenser like those ones that I showed you on the roof of that uh, working, they can keep the head pressure down to 125 pounds all the time. They work really well. But on a regular piece of equipment or a over the road truck or an automobile, they'll run somewhere up higher around 200 pounds. 99.7% of the time the only thing that causes high head pressure is no air across the condenser. That's why the head side is, is mostly not to be concerned with. If the engine fan is working, the condenser's clean for, with, so it's able to have airflow across it, you don't have any problems. Less than 1% of the time, there will be an internal blockage in a multi-pass condenser. Now, how that works and how I found that out is years ago on a Freightliner, cab over Freightliner, I checked it out and I looked at the sight glass and it's fizzing. I see Freon flowing through it. So I assume that it doesn't have enough Freon in it and this is why it's not cooling. So to check it out, I added a little more to it to see if it would start cooling. But what it, what I found was, as I added it, I still see it fizzing, but it starts blowing off the 500-pound pressure switch off the back of the compressor. And I said, well, how is this possible? How can I have 500 pounds over here, and over here it's still fizzing and it's not full, not full of liquid? So I, it took me a while to think about it, and without ever seeing one of those condensers before at that time, I thought, I wonder if that condenser is a multi-pass condenser, and part of it is blocked up. Well, I took the condenser off, and I looked in the end, the inlet side of the condenser, and there was five passes through there. And what had happened is about three of those passes were blocked up with, with gunk. So that allowed two passes to pass the Freon so I could see it in the sight glass. And the other three were blocking it up bad enough that it caused it to go up 500 pounds. Now that, you know, that one really threw me for a loop for a while, but I got to the bottom of it, and that's, that's what the cause was. Leaks. Leaks have to be found. If a system has to be charged up every year, people will call them and say, yeah, I need a truck recharged. It needs to be charged up every year. It's normal, isn't it? No, it's not normal. If it needs to be charged up, it's leaked. Leaks have to be found. During our diagnostic procedure, if the system is empty of Freon, we need to locate the leak. This can be done with an electronic leak detector and or simple soap and water. Now, I know that there's a lot of cool stuff out there today. There's a lot of gizmos. There's, there's all the dyes and everything to put in the system to find the leak. There's infrared lights and there's all sorts of stuff and they and they work they work good 
but in all these years I've been doing this and still doing this, I've never used any of those things. A simple electronic leak detector in soap and water is all I ever use. And I find the leaks all the time. Now, if it's empty, it's possible that the machine has been worked on. They dump the system, pull the compressor to the side or remove a line and put it back together. They got the, the, the engine back up and running or something, and that particular shop or ser, uh, field service man just didn't charge the air conditioner back up. Well, one has to ask that question. Sometimes, you know, I ask the field guy or, or whoever, I says, was this machine taken apart? I said, no, we don't think so. Okay, so then instead of going down that avenue, we'll go down and check it for leaks. Everything needs to be tested until it's found. That leak has to be found. Otherwise, we're not doing a good job. If we just let it go, say, well, see how long it lasts, and we'll get it down the road in a couple of months. I don't think so. That's not the way you do it. With the machine off, Check for oil residue on all the lines and fittings. You'll see that oil leakage with dirt cake to it, where it's been leaked. Check for oil residue on the compressor shaft seal. And that means around the, the back of the, the clutch and the pulley, you'll see caked up dirt that stuck to oil. Anywhere there's oil leaking in the air conditioner system means it's leaking. Pressure up the system of Freon. Take electronic leak detector and check the compressor shaft seal. Stick it right in the front of it, in the center of it, where the where the the nut is that holds the clutch on. Check it there. Check it through the holes in the front of the clutch and see if you can get it the uh, sniff it there. This is a common leak. If a shaft seal is seeping, change the compressor. Any more today is cost prohibitive. To to change shaft seals. I haven't changed the shaft seal in over 20 years. Now one thing is, is uh, sometimes the leak is so small that you need to pull the clutch plate shoe off. You need to take the nut off and, and pull that apart or on depending on what compressor it is, just pull the whole clutch and pull you off so you can get in there. But in that in that shaft seal back down in there, sometimes you can even see it bubble out. But you got to get that clutch off of it in order to see it. And if you can never find a leak anywhere else on the system, it's more than likely still coming out of that compressor shaft seal. Spray soap and water solution on all hoses and fittings. Shake the lines. Make it leak. Shake them rubber lines, shake the steel ones. Do it with care, but shake them pretty good. These are sometimes slow, and one needs to be patient with them. Leak test condenser and evaporator pipes. These are tricky as they can be stress cracked and only leak while machine is moving and shaking. Now, in the metal on evaporators and condensers, they can just get a stress crack, just, just a straight crack. And you can leak test it and leak test it and leak test it, and you, you won't find it. But until you shake it with soap and water, shake it pretty good, and you'll see it leak. And, and that's... It's really baffling to, to, to a guy that checks those out and can't find a leak on the machine. Well, I found them stress cracks, and you've got to move stuff to make them leak because those leaks don't leak unless the machine is working and running, the truck working and running. If a leak is found here, they can be repaired with silver solder out in the field if they're copper. If they're aluminum, pretty much it, you just take it and... Replace the, replace the coil, replace the coil.
If during our diagnostics we found a leaking or bad compressor, recover the system and change. Do not try to change the shaft seal, it is cost prohibitive. Most all compressors from the factory come with oil in them. Do not add more. Compressors that do not have oil in them, when they are new, will have instructions with them. They will tell you how much to add to them. They'll be tagged or there'll be a, a, a paper that comes with them. Dryers. Dryers need to be changed anytime the system has been open for repair, especially in high humid environments. If you're in Florida and you open that system up just to put a new line on it, and it's only open for five minutes, that dryer is destroyed. It will absorb that humidity in there and destroy it, and what that'll do is uh, deteriorate the system if it gets moisture in it. Refrigerant oil. PAG oil is the normal, norm, normally used automotive oil. Oil is the one thing that people mostly get wrong. Some say too much is bad. Most all compressor failures from the factories, brand new, are from lack of oil. Most all field change compressors or shop change compressor failures are from lack of oil. Some people got an idea that you can have too much oil in the system, and you can at some point. But a lot of people hardly put any oil in a system. And here's one. Several years ago, I was doing the service work for a major equipment dealer. I was doing all their factory warranty work, and I did their field service too. Now, they had brand new pieces of equipment come in, and while they were just test driving the equipment, test using it, the compressor would lock up. And there was many of them that done this. And so I pulled those off, changed the compressor, and added about six more ounces of oil to the system on top of what came in the compressor. And they went out and they worked just fine, never, never had to come back one on them. But it wasn't too long, no, maybe a year after those particular ones, the particular factory called me. They found out that all the ones that were changed in Denver were uh, doing well. Now, they asked me, they said, what am I doing that uh, the other guys aren't doing? And I said, probably putting oil back in the system. And they said, well, you know, they had the misunderstanding that they needed to remove some oil out of the compressor when they put them systems together. And what they did with that idea, they wrote that into their service manuals. And their field service guys were following the manuals. Now, mo most of the time, the OEM manuals are, are the thing to do. They're, they're fine. But these engineers were just a little misguided on this oil thing this one time. And so their, their field mechanics would go out and change the compressor and remove the oil out of the compressor and put it in, and then they just kept failing. And they did this all over the country. Now, I didn't have any comebacks because I put six ounces more oil in the system on top of what already came in the new compressor. So, you know, things happen. People got some different ideas, but systems have to have oil. Now, systems have to have enough oil in them that as the oil circulates through the system with Freon, there still needs to be enough oil in the system to, to maintain some in the compressor so the compressor don't seize up. Remember, that's just what I talked about what this manufacturer was having trouble with.
didn't have enough oil. So if you can imagine in this compressor, you got to have a, an oil level in it. Apply refrigerant oil to every O-ring and fitting that you put together on the system, even if you, even on the part that you crimp to a hose. Oil that up. Oil on an air conditioning system works as a seal. It seals things so you, it isn't put together dry and cause a leak. When any parts are changed, always add oil. And my theory has always been, and it's never failed me, that if four ounces oil may save a system if it is low. We don't know how much oil is exactly in the system, but we know that it's ran a long time the way it is. But four ounces may save it if it's low. If the system has enough, four more ounces of oil won't hurt it. If you change a line in a dryer, inject four ounces of oil. If you change the compressor or the dryer line, add four ounces of oil. When systems have had a leak, they've lost oil because the oil runs through the system. This will deplete the compressor oil if they, when they've had a leak. Evacuating the system is necessary to remove moisture from the system. The vacuum pump will pull the system down to 28 and a half inches of vacuum at sea level if there's no leaks in it, if the system has no leaks. At this stage, the vacuum pump boils the moisture out of the system. But keep in mind, depending on what altitude you are and what part of the country you are, you lose one inch of vacuum for every thousand foot of altitude. Evacuate system for 15 to 30 minutes. Now if you're in, if you're at sea level and you're in the, you're out on the west coast or east coast or midwest or you know the, down in Florida or Texas where it's really humid, you know, the longer you the longer you pump the system down, the better. An hour is fine. When finished, shut off the manifold valves before shutting down the va vacuum pump. Let the system set in vacuum with nothing running for five to ten minutes. Just just let it sit there and watch the vacuum gauge. Now, if you're at five thousand feet of sea level you're going to lose five inches of vacuum. So the maximum 28 and a half inches of vacuum is at sea level, but if you're at 5,000 feet, what's well, five from 28? You got 23 and a half inches, about 24, you'll see on your gauge. That is where your, your vacuum gauge will go to, is about 24 inches of vacuum. Now watch that gauge. Well, it's just sitting there. If it doesn't lose any any vacuum, you, it's pretty good chance that you fixed all the leaks. It's not leaking. If it's losing no vacuum, we're ready to charge. While in a vacuum, hook up the oil injector between the Freon bottle and the manifold. Open the Freon valve and the manifold valves on both sides. Blow the oil into the system, then shut off manifold valves. This is a two ounce oil injector, folks. Now sometimes what I've done in the past is I've taken uh, two of these oil injectors and I aluminum welded them around so I had a four ounce injector. And that worked out pretty good because I like to, instead of having to do this twice with a two ounce, I can add four ounces at one time uh, before, uh, at one time. Start the engine 
and turn the AC switches on max cold and thermostat to cold. Charge with gas only through blue low side hose until fully charged. You may have a charging station uh, that you can just dial it in if you know exactly how much Freon to put in it. You can do that and you can use your oil injector uh, in the charging station and put four ounces of oil in it. While charging with gas only at 1200 RPM, feel the suction pipe for cold. Watch the sight glass at the same time. When the glass is clear, suction pipes are cold. Shut off the manifold valve and run system. We're good to go. Turn the blowers to low blow and watch for the compressor to cycle out on the thermostat. We want to get it at, at 1200 RPM. You get it up there where the, the compressor is working good and the system's cooling good. You want to turn that down to low blow so there's just very little air. The, the, the slower the air moves across the evaporator, the colder it gets. And that's what we're trying to do here is get it cold on that thermostat to make sure that it cycles out on, on the system, cycles the compressor out. Want to check all operations. Go back over the work performed and check, check, and recheck. Here's a routine maintenance list that I use on the monthly and bi-monthly. Pretty much every time that I service a machine or look at a machine, I go through this process right here. I run and check every system. I check all operations. I check the blowers. I check the controls. Check Freon levels. Check the compressor belts. I check the compressor mounts and brackets and make sure that everything is solid and everything is in place. I check the thermostat to make sure that it cycles in and out. I check for oil residue on lines and fittings. I check the condenser fans. Check the hot water valves. Remember we talked about the hot water valves. They need to be shut down when it's in the AC mode or during the main season manually shut them off. Check the filters, the cab filters, the fresh air filters, and the recirculate inside filter. Cleaner changes needed. This is very important. Filters will cause you a lot of problems. Pressure wash the evaporator and the condenser coil. Factory OEM, OEM service guidelines and service manuals. Always check with your OEM factory service manuals. Check those out. Follow all of their guidelines because they're, they're mostly right. What you learn here today is from our 30 years of diagnosing AC systems. All air conditioning works the same, but there are many variations to their operations. And what we covered here are just basic principles. This is what I wanted this for to teach you is just the basic principles of how this air conditioner system works so that you can take off and, and go and grow from that. But get a basic understanding with principles of it. Freon reclamation. It is by law that all refrigerants be recovered. Even the environment friendly refrigerants. The fine is heavy if caught venting. The last I heard it was ten to twenty thousand dollars if you get caught and it's not the employer that pays for it, it's a serviceman. Well thank you for joining me today with this webinar. You will receive a PDF file on what we covered here and an email support for 14 days. My email address is, is training at usair1.com and that's with a one number one usair1.com. I hoped I helped you today. I hope whatever level you're at that it helped you get a better understanding of how this worked and I thank you again.